Tensions around the Euphrates River are escalating. China has joined Russia, Iran, Iraq, and Hezbollah in the fight against ISIS. The US, Great Britain, Saudi Arabia, and France are also launching attacks against the Islamic State. Where will it all lead? We'll talk about it on this edition of Politics and Religion. Look, there are two things I don't discuss, politics and religion. In my house, we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. I'll talk to you about anything except politics and religion. I never talk about politics and religion. Politics determines how we'll live here on Earth. Religion determines how we'll live forever. I'm Irvin Baxter. I think it's time we talk about it. It's getting quite crowded in the Middle East. Now then, China is flying attacks on ISIS off of its aircraft carrier just off the coast of Syria. The Russians are attacking some 20 attacks per day. In addition to that, Hezbollah's involved, Syria's involved, Iraq is involved, Iran is involved, the United States, France, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Great Britain, all of them are involved in air attacks against ISIS. How is ISIS standing up under this? And how are we going to avoid conflicts between Russia and the US and all the, the powers that are present? Actually, the US and Russia are using the same air base just west of Baghdad. They're sharing an air base, the United States and Russia. So the question is, what's going on here? Are we seeing a world government action actually taking place, even though it's not being announced with all these powers converging against ISIS? Is it gonna work? What if they're not able to defeat ISIS? All these are questions that are in our mind today. And I, I want to explore some of these things. First of all, let me go into some more detail with you. Uh, Russia's military intervention in Syria has expanded radically in two directions. Moscow on Friday, October the 2nd, well, first of all, China sent, Mos sent word to Moscow that J-15 fighter bombers would shortly join the Russian air campaign that was launched Wednesday, September the 30th. Baghdad has moreover offered Moscow an air base for targeting the Islamic State, now occupying large swaths of Iraqi territory. Now let's remember, the Islamic State, or ISIS as some people like to refer to it, now controls about 70% of Syria and probably close to 50% of Iraq. We're talking about territory larger than Great Britain. Think about that. This entity that likes to behead people in front of cameras and send the videos around the world, this entity that has put a Jordanian pilot in a cage, doused him with gasoline, set him on fire, videoed it, and sent it around the world. They put heads of their enemies on sticks and mounted them on fence posts. And they're controlling land larger than Great Britain? Well, that's the case. Now, President Obama called it the JV squad, but so far he's not figured out how to defeat the JV squad. Now then, Vladimir Putin is asserting his influence dramatically right now, flying in bombers, establishing the S-300 anti-aircraft missile defense system over all of Syria, declaring a no-fly zone. 
So does that mean then that the United States can't fly over Syria? We've been flying over Syria now for several months, carrying out attacks against her. So are we cooperating hand in glove? What about Israel? Israel has always reserved the right to attack anyone who moves weaponry down into the hands of Hezbollah in Lebanon because they are determined that Hezbollah is not going to get advanced weapons that are so good that they would threaten the welfare of the nation of Israel. So anytime they detect there are weapons of an advanced nature being smuggled into Lebanon, which of course is the home base of Hezbollah, but Hezbollah is over in Syria fighting for the Syrian government. Now that Israel's got to worry about these uh, S-300 anti-aircraft missiles, which are very, very advanced, being installed all over Syria by Russia. It is such a concern that Benjamin Netanyahu, a week or so ago, met with Vladimir Putin to make sure that Russia and Israel don't have a collision. Furthermore, one of the high ups in the Russian military is due to visit Israel this week. So what in the world? What is going on? How do we make any sense of this? You know, it's so interesting. The only way really to understand what's going on. Sometimes we don't even think our leaders know what's going on. But the only way to really understand what's going on is to go to the Bible. I believe it was David that said, Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when we go to the Bible and we understand how the nations are going to be aligned in the end time, which by the way, we're already entering into right now. But when we can see a snapshot of the way things are going to be as everything wraps up, then we can look at the way things are right now. And suddenly we can say, okay, here's where we are today. Here's where we're going to end up. Now we can understand clearer how things are presently developing. This particular article goes on to say that Russia's military intervention in Syria has five additional participants, namely China, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah. The J-15 warplanes will take off from the Chinese Leonin CV-16 aircraft carrier, which reached Syrian shores on September the 26th. This will be a landmark event for Beijing, its first military operation in the Middle East ever, as well as the carrier's first taste of action in conditions of real combat. So China's getting her military feet wet in this conflict with ISIS. The article goes on to say that as an added incentive, he noted that this would give Moscow the chance to deal with the 2,500 Chechen Muslims who he said are fighting with ISIS in Iraq. So Russia is getting involved here, but there are presently 2,500 Chechen rebels that have now left Chechen, which has long been a sore spot with Russia. They've left there and they've gone down and joined themselves to ISIS. Now, when they do this, this is going to give Russia the chance to to wreak vengeance upon them. Now, let me give you a little bit more of this article because it really helps us to see what's going on. A joint Russian-Iranian-Syrian-Iraqi war room has been working since last week out of the Iraqi Defense Ministry and Military Staff Headquarters in Baghdad. So Russia, Iran, Syria, and Iraq are all working together from this military war room, which is located in Iran. Uh, This command center is also organized in the transfer of Iranian and pro-Iranian Shiite forces into Syria. So now we're having Iranian forces. This is escalating dramatically right now, too. Baghdad and Moscow have just concluded a deal 
for the Russian Air Force to start using the Al Takadum Air Base at Habanie, 74 kilometers west of Baghdad. That would be uh, something around 50 miles both as a way station for the Russian air corridor to Syria and as a launching pad for bombing missions against ISIS and infrastructure in northern Iraq and northern Syria. But here's the thing that I find really interesting. Uh, Russia's gained uh, this military enclave in Iraq just as it has in Syria. So now we have Russia in Syria, Russia in Iraq adjoining Syria, uh, where it's taken the base outside Latakia on the western coast of Syria. At the same time, the Habanea Air Base also serves U.S. forces operating in Iraq, which number an estimated 5,000. So we got 5,000 troops on this air base, and Russia is using the air base. So it appears that we're really in alliance with Russia against ISIS. It's not being painted that way. Russia is being painted as a rival and as a threat to the United States, but it doesn't look like that's the case. It looks like the U.S. and Russia are in fact corroborating in the effort against ISIS. Now, while all this is going on, there's great discontent at the United Nations because they've been trying to vote on this Syrian situation for several years now. And every time they reach a resolution that they think will help solve the situation, Russia and China veto it. Let me give you a little bit of background on what's going on there. We've just come out of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Now, let's see what's going on. Since the war in Syria erupted in 2011, more than 250,000 Syrians have been killed. Wow, 250,000. That's a quarter of a million people have been killed, and at least one million people have been wounded. More than 12 million people, nearly half of the country of Syria, have been displaced. I mean, there's refugees going everywhere, and yet, the UN Security Council remains deadlocked and unable to act. So here you have man's kind, mankind's last hope for peace. That's the way it was labeled when I was in high school. I'll never forget it. Open the US history book and the last chapter was the United Nations, mankind's last hope for peace. Well, that was a few years ago now, of course. So if the UN is in fact mankind's last hope for peace. It's not much of a hope because here it remains deadlocked. So listen to it. And yet the UN Security Council remains deadlocked, hamstrung by Russia's alliance with Syria, leading to the strongest push yet at this year's General Assembly for reform of the UN's most powerful body. The UN Security Council is where the power lies at the United Nations. Four years ago, when I would raise the issue of veto restraint as one of our talking points, people would almost laugh you out of the room, said Simon Adams, the director of the Global Center for of the Responsibility to Protect, a New York-based nonprofit. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get back. We're talking today about the powers of all the world that are converging on Syria right now. The sign of the four blood moons. What is this teaching of the four blood moons? The teaching says that when four consecutive blood moons fall on Jewish feast days, a major event affecting the Jewish people will occur. Four blood moons will occur on Jewish feast days between April 15, 2014 and September 28, 2015. It is believed that some great event will occur during this time that will change the world forever. Obviously, this time lies just ahead. 
To watch a preview of this video, go to endtime.com and under Irvin's thoughts, click the sign of the four blood moons. Take your understanding of the end time to a new level with our outlines and quizzes workbook. This workbook accompanies our Understanding the End Time 14 lesson series. As you watch each lesson, follow along with the outlines, then take a quiz and check your answers at the end. These are all contained in one convenient workbook so you can study as well as teach prophecy wherever you go. Use it as a study guide to cement main points and scriptures that Irvin teaches in each lesson. It's also a great tool if you host an end time Bible study. Help your group solidify what they're learning by getting a copy for each person to follow along with the video and then to take home and study on their own. Get the workbook by calling 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and be ready to instruct many as the scripture says. Great conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Saturday evening and Sunday. Uh, terrific church there. It was a fabulous meeting. Many of you were there. So thank you for attending. I hope it was a blessing to you. Uh, nevertheless, the conferences roll on. We're jamming as many in as we can before the end of the year. This week, I will be on Friday evening, October the 9th at 730 at Metairie, Louisiana, which of course is a suburb of of uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. I will be speaking there on America's God-given destiny. And then the next day we'll be traveling to Madison, Mississippi, which is just outside of Jackson, Mississippi. And on Saturday evening, October the 10th at 6 p.m., I will be speaking again on America's God-given destiny there because this is such a critical DVD, a, a critical lesson that I want everyone to hear it. And then on Sunday at 9.30 a.m., again, I will be at the Madison Parkway Pentecostal Church at 9.30 in the morning and speaking on breaking prophetic fulfillments. And that will include a question and answer session. We're doing that quite a bit lately and the people are just loving it because they get to talk about some things that maybe we haven't talked about before. So let me give you the exact address so that you'll know. We're going to be in Metairie, uh, that's Friday evening, at the New Life Tabernacle, 6017 Airline Highway in Metairie, Louisiana. And then in Madison, Mississippi, we'll, we will be at the Parkway Pentecostal Church, 601 Reunion Parkway in Madison. That'll be both on Saturday evening and on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. So wherever you are, uh, do your best to attend these conferences. Uh, we are in the end time right now. These, thing, these messages will help you to understand exactly where we are. So all of you are invited. And oh, by the way, don't forget this is the last week to sign up for the tour to Israel. The tour is November the 12th through the 23rd. We have a little window here. We have a few seats left. So don't wait if you want to go. Get on the phone right now and give us a call. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME and simply ask to speak to someone about the tour. Now, I want to get back uh, to what we're dealing with here today because this problem with Syria is suddenly growing exponentially. I mean, when you think about China, Russia, Syria, Iraq, Iran, the United States, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, France, Great Britain, all of them are involved in this conflict, trying to deal with this tumor called ISIS. So I really think there's a coalition of about 60 nations that have expressed their support for the efforts of Barack Obama. So we really have half the nations of the world nearly involved in this conflict. I think President Obama's trying to put together the appearance of a a global action here against ISIS. Will he succeed? Will he fail? I don't know. Here's what we do know. We know that from that area of the world where they're all fighting right now, a war will begin. It's described very 
in very much detail in Revelation chapter number 9, verse 13 through 16. It says there, this war will come from the Euphrates River. ISIS, all of the river in Syria and in Iraq from the northern border of Iraq all the way down to Baghdad, which is about halfway through Iraq. 18 months. ISIS has taken control of about 50 to 70 percent of the Euphrates River. And that's where all of these powers are fighting. And your Bible says a war is going to emanate from that area that will one third of the human race. Now, this is so sobering. It's hard to believe. When we say these words, it's like one third of mankind, that's 2.3 billion people. So we know that's where we're headed. We know it's about time for that war. So when we see all these powers converging, what's going to happen? The Bible doesn't tell us for certain who's going to be involved in this war. Now, the Euphrates River is a 100% Islamic river. So the forces of Islam are going to be involved. The Bible doesn't say whether Russia will be involved, whether China will be involved, whether the United States will be involved, or all of the above. All I can tell you is, it is escalating dramatically right now. Do I want it to happen right now? Absolutely not. It's going to be the worst disaster that's ever hit the world. I mean, we're talking about up until World War I, we never had a war with one million fatalities. World War I, 8.2 million died. We called it the Great War. And then we tried to stop war by establishing the League of Nations. It didn't work. 20 years later, World War II. This time, 52 million. Now remember, from the beginning of mankind until the beginning of the 20th century, we never had a war with a million fatalities. Now all of a sudden, we've got two wars, one with 8 million, one with 52 million. And now the Bible prophesies another war coming that's going to kill one third of the human race, that's 2.3 billion. That's 40 times World War II. Now, ladies and gentlemen, none of these are my predictions. I'm going straight from the scriptures. And I wouldn't dare to make a prediction like this if it were not in the Bible, because it's unbelievable, frankly, that we're getting ready to enter a war that's going to kill one third of the human race. But that's what the Bible prophesies. And when I see this buildup of all the great powers, China, Russia, the United States, France, Great Britain. I mean, these are the big five that are on the Security Council. These, these are the five powers that wield veto power at the UN Security Council. And they're all involved in this conflict. So where's it going to end up? Well, we're going to end up in World War III. And when it happens, one third of the human race is going to be wiped off the face of the planet. And that's so hard for me to say because I don't want that. But it's going to happen because iniquity is so pervasive in our world. I'll never forget the night after the Supreme Court ruled legitimizing same-sex marriage. That night, President Obama just couldn't wait. He was itching. And that evening, what do we see? We see the White House lit up with rainbow colors in celebration. Our White House celebrating sodomy. I looked at that and I was sick at my stomach because I knew what it meant. Unless we really repent quick, it means judgment. I mean, God rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed those two cities over that sin. That's where we get the name sodomy, from Sodom. So when I look at this thing, I think, oh my goodness, what are we in for here? What's going to happen? Well, I'm telling you, this is coming. I'm not willing to tell you that this present conflict is going to produce it, but I'm not willing to tell you it won't either because all the forces are converging. We're going to see how it all comes out. 
It's coming. There's no doubt about it. It's coming. You say, what do I do? Make sure you're right with God. That's the only defense. If you are not where you should be with God right this moment, then do something about it immediately. Because I can't guarantee you. I can't guarantee anybody. When one person out of three on this planet dies, I don't know how it's all going to come down. I don't even know the United States is going to be involved. I think we are going to be because it takes a lot of nuclear weapons to kill 2.3 billion people. And we've got a lot of nuclear weapons. Plus, we're involved in everything that goes on in the Middle East. But the Bible doesn't say the U.S. is involved. It doesn't say Russia is involved. It does say Russia is involved at Armageddon, but it doesn't say Russia is involved right now. We just simply don't know. All we know is it's going to start the, from the Euphrates River. There will, will be an army of 200 million soldiers that will be there. Now, China, for the first time in history, has involved themselves in the Middle East. Mao Zedong, the late leader of China, boasted that he could field an army of 200 million soldiers. Well, the prophecy in verse 16 of chapter number 9 of Revelation says that the, there will be an army of 200 million. Mao Zedong boasted that he could do that. Well, if he can do it, India can do it because their population is almost equal. And if India can do it, Islam can do it because they have a bigger population than either China or India. They have 1.6 billion people. So we have three entities on this planet, only three, three entities that have the ability to field the army that's prophesied in Revelation chapter number 9, verse number 16. So we know for certain either China or India or Islam is going to be involved. We, we're pretty sure Islam is going to be involved. Whether it becomes involved as an entire religion worldwide, I wouldn't be surprised. But China now is there. So perhaps both of them are going to be involved. All I'm telling you is that we shouldn't just go to sleep at the wheel and forget about it. Once again, what do we do? What do you do? What do I do? Make sure your position with God is correct. Make sure that if your life ended today, you know that you have eternal life. And I don't mean play games with it. I mean know for certain. Now you may be thinking, but how do I know that? Well, Jesus gave us the answer. He said, except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that's where eternal life is, is in the kingdom of God. So what do we mean by being born again? I've written a brochure very carefully, and it's free to anyone who would like to have it in the whole world. It's available on the, our website right now. Simply go to endtime.com and about Halfway down the page, you'll see, what do you mean, born again? Read it. If you haven't done everything in there, then get it done. If you need help with that, pick up the phone and call us. Where do I go to be born again? How can I do these things that are here in, in this uh, brochure? Because Jesus said, except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, those of you that are on hold, we're getting ready to come to you immediately after our break. I wanted to lay the foundation for this program today, but I also do want your calls because this is not just another time. I don't know how quick it's going to develop. It could blow sky high within the next four weeks, or it could drag on for the next four months, or maybe it'll spring out for another year or two or three. I don't see how that's going to happen. Nevertheless, here's what Jesus said. Be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not, your Lord doth come. Did you just tune in now and miss the first 30 minutes of End of the Age? N no, it's really okay. I Sorry, that was probably a little overdramatic. Anyway, just go to endtime.com and on the homepage, click the Archives button. There you can watch or listen to tons of previous broadcasts. You can also subscribe to End of the Age on iTunes and keep up to date with the prophecies in your podcast library. Oh, and uh, just for future reference, the program does start at 3 p.m. Central Time, j just so you're not late next time. 
Never miss another broadcast again by checking out the End of the Age archives page. Jesus said that there would be a particular generation that would see specific things take place, and this would be the people that would see His second coming to the earth. The big question is, can we know this generation? Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Jesus said, When you see these things, what things was he talking about? In the DVD, This Generation Shall Not Pass, Irvin discusses the events that must occur that will let us know the generation that shall not pass until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Get this enlightening lesson by calling 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. We'll go front thing and then we're coming straight to the phones. Uh, in this article about the United Nations, uh, Simon Adams, the director of the Global Center of the Responsibility to Protect. Remember that phrase, responsibility to protect. The United Nations, when it was founded, its constitution said it could not intervene in the internal affairs of a nation. It could only arbitrate between sovereign nations. Well, in 2005, I was in the United Nations building when they changed all that. I attended the press conference with Kofi Annan, and he came there to say, we've passed something that's wonderful. It's called responsibility to protect. And all it said was that if a people, uh, if its government was perpetrating uh, acts of genocide, of apartheid, of religious exclusiveness against a government, that the United Nations had a responsibility to intervene and to protect the people against their government. As soon as I heard it, I knew what it was because I knew there were powers within the United Nations that desperately wanted to have the ability to violate the sovereignty of states and they wanted for the United Nations to be able to intervene in any country that did not run its business like the UN wanted it to. Well, here's this man, Simon Adams, the director of the Global Center of the Responsibility to Protect. He says, unfortunately, the tragedy of Syria has made the issue of the veto a real issue at the United Nations in a way that it hasn't been since 1943. Calls for the Security Council reform are a frequent feature of the annual General Assembly. Several speakers at this year's General Assembly focused on the need to reform the UN Security Council so that the ability to veto would not paralyze it. As a matter of fact, according to this article, dozens of other speakers use their time to push for a radical overhaul of this council. Now, one thing they would like to do is somehow define certain times when a nation was not allowed to use its veto power. The reason I bring this up is because a lot of people have asked me, well, how is the UN going to invade Israel at Armageddon as long as the US still has its veto power? I suspect the United States may not have its veto power by that time. And that will be the expl explanation. And here we see today some 75 countries in Europe, Africa, and Latin America have backed a proposal well, let me tell you exactly what the proposal is. On Wednesday, dozens of nations signed onto a French proposal that would voluntarily limit the use of the veto in the cases concerning genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. Now, these are the very things that uh, the United Nations and the enemies of Israel like to accuse her of. They're accusing her of war crimes. They define war crimes as when you take territory that you move your population into that territory or move population that was there out of that territory. Well, they scream to high heavens that that's what has happened. Israel hasn't really moved her population is in. 
her population has gone out there and built homes in this territory, which belonged to no one prior to the 67 war. It was a mandate under the British mandate uh, after World War I. Uh, so consequently, it doesn't really apply, but they're making it apply because they're trying to say that this was Palestinian land. The fact is it was part of the Palestinian mandate and both Jews and Arabs were Palestinians. Anyway, they're now trying to say, and they've defined it here, that, that they need to suspend the veto power in cases of genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. Those are exactly the things they're accusing Israel of today. And if they would do this, that could explain why the international community would be able to move against Israel and the United Nations, the United States would no longer have the ability to veto this activity. Okay, with that said, let's get to our phones. Joseph is calling from Canada. Hello, Joseph. Hello. Hello, my brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Nice to hear from you. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you all the time. I have two questions. Last Wednesday, we were talking about Revelation 12, and some people were saying that uh, the woman is uh, the Virgin Mary, and others were saying it was the church. I tried to quote uh, Ezekiel uh, uh, 16 and Genesis uh, 36. Uh, I was wondering, do you have a specific uh, scripture that I can just bring back this Wednesday and show them. Uh, and, the other, and the other question was, uh, uh, when Pope uh, Leo III crowned uh, Charlie Maine, um, he declared him emperor of uh, the Holy Roman Empire. This time around, it has to be the same, right? The Pope eventually has to crown somebody uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So do, do we know anything specific about that? Whether the Pope will actually crown uh, this man as the emperor of the whole Roman Empire, he may. But all we know is the Bible says that the Pope will cause the world to worship and to give their allegiance to the Antichrist. Whether he does it by placing a crown on his head, whether he does it by simply saying this is the person that God has sent, and he may even end up calling him the Messiah. But whatever the case is, whether he puts a crown on his head or not, we cannot say. Now, concerning your first question about Mary and the 12 stars, I know that this is widely taught and many Roman Catholics believe this, but the question is, what do the 12 stars mean? Well, we know that Israel, they, they had 12 stars. Uh, they have 12 tribes. And back in the book of Genesis, if you'll remember the dream of Joseph, yes. he saw his mother and father and his 11 brethren, and this, the vision was the same as the one in Revelation 12. It was the same vision of Israel. The 12, there were 11 stars because Joseph was the 12th one, but there were 11 stars and Joseph and his father and his mother. So it was the exact same symbolism used for Israel in Genesis as is used in Revelation chapter number uh, 12. And then it goes on to say uh, in verse number 14 that the woman with the 12 stars will be persecuted in the end time. Well, if you understand the other parts of Bible prophecy in Revelation 17, uh, the woman, the Roman church and the Pope together with the Antichrist will be persecuting Israel in the end time. So if that were Mary, that's like Mary's being persecuted in the end time. But the, the truth of the matter is, it is the Roman church and the, uh, the power of the one world governmental system that will be set up by then that will actually be putting pressure on Israel. So that, I hope that helps you out. Yeah, well, that's exactly it because uh, some people were saying, yeah, then if it's not, the, it's, if it's not Mary, then it's got to be the church because it's going to be persecuted. And somebody was complaining about saying, yeah, but the church should be raptor. So, it, you know, it was this kind of a, a back and forth talking. But I did, I did present Ezekiel 16 and Genesis 36. I, I did that. But, uh, okay, thank you anyway. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Appreciate the call very much. Let's now go to Carrie calling from Indiana. Hello, Carrie. Hello. What's on your mind, Carrie? Hi. Um, you know, we've been... Talking about, I love you giving us all the news and um, what's happening with all the countries and with ISIS over there. I guess it's kind of hitting me today and actually for several days. I think that I just want to kind of say that World War III has already begun. Um, 
just like World War One and World War II, uh, how the powers would start taking this area and this area, and it wasn't really understood around the world yet until real hell broke loose on everybody. <laughs> I just kind of respectfully like to say that it has begun, and it has begun from the Euphrates River area. And uh, and thank you, brother, for also mentioning the United States. Um, kind of worries me sometimes uh, that uh, still the body of Christ or those who claim to be uh, just are playing games and the false doctrine and happy church and disasters coming and judgments coming. And yeah, you know, it's just here. <laughs> like you well, try to tell us the end time is here. Yeah, well, And uh, it's really grieving my heart to know that people won't listen and they won't be born again just because they're so not hearing the truth, don't want to hear the truth. It's too hard to hear. So yeah. I just kind of think that it's kind of starting already and we're still got our heads in the sand some of us you know well you know carrie uh there are people who have believed for a long time that world war three actually began on 911. they felt uh -huh. like that was the first attack I mean, yeah. I'm talking about such people as Thomas Friedman, who is the famous columnist for the New York Times, uh, right. James Woolsey, who was over the CIA during the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. He also mm -hmm. believes that. And so uh, you're not alone in believing that World War III has already started. But as yeah. far as it escalating in all of the fury, as it's described in Revelation chapter 9, right. uh, obviously that hasn't hit with its full force yet. But anyway... Right. Uh, uh, sure, appreciate the phone call, Carrie. Appreciate your input because uh, I don't think that you're off base. So thank you very much. Now, uh, I want to, let me see, do we have time? I think we do. I think we have time for one more call. Uh, Mary calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Mary. Yes, hello, Dr. Baxter. Hi. I, I'm a longtime listener, first time caller. Thank you for all that you do. Well, thanks for calling. Um, my question is, um, I had just read an article today from the Assyrian National News, and uh, it just talked about unspeakable, horrific acts against Christians that, that are taking place. And uh, to me, this seems like, you know, it's their tribulation. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, those things are happening there. They're not happening here right now, but is there any way that we could be in the tribulation that we... We just don't realize it yet. Could there have been a peace agreement that we don't know about, or do you think that will be so public that we'll that we will know? Um, uh, we so can... That's my question, and and I'll take my answer off the air. Okay, so thank Mary. you so much. Good question, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, we cannot be in the great tribulation as defined in Scripture. We're talking about that three and one half year period that immediately precedes the Battle of Armageddon. We cannot be in that particular time right now because three and a half years before the Great Tribulation begins, there must be a peace agreement which creates a Palestinian state, leaves Jewish people living in the Palestinian state as a Jewish minority, and the Temple Mount will be under a sharing arrangement. During the first three and a half years of this peace agreement, the Jewish Temple will be rebuilt on their portion of the Temple Mount. So we know we're not in the Great Tribulation. However, that does not preclude the possibility of us being in Great Tribulation. I mean, the apostles were in Great Tribulation. Eleven of the first 12 apostles were martyred for the name of Jesus, and millions have been since then. So we can be in Tribulation without being in the Great Tribulation I've spoken of uh, in the final three and a half years. But if you're over there and they're cutting your head off, well, it certainly feels like the Great Tribulation anyway. Stay with us. We'll take more of your calls. Hello, this is Judy Baxter. My husband and I would like to invite you on End Times Fall Prophecy Tour to Israel. I've been there 24 times and I'm still excited about going. I love sailing on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on the water and going to the garden tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. And as you probably know, my husband's favorite place is standing on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem where Jesus will soon return. Not only will we walk in the footsteps of Jesus when he was here on earth, but we will also be walking into the future. 
learning from the Bible what will soon take place. I can't recommend a greater prophecy lesson than going to Israel. We look forward to getting to know you as we have made many friends on these tours. Space is limited, so register today by calling 1-800-END-TIME and ask to speak to my daughter Jana or my granddaughter Holly about the tour. In Israel, there is a special feeling that is hard to explain. It's probably knowing that Jesus Christ himself walked in that land. I hope you will come and experience a trip you will never forget. The Lord bless each and every one of you. One more time this coming Friday night, October the 9th in Metairie, Louisiana. Saturday evening, October the 10th at 6 p.m. in Madison, Mississippi. And again on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. in Madison, Mississippi. Uh, try to join us there. Hope you can all be there with us. Going to be great things. And if you have not yet heard our lesson on America's God-given destiny, I think it will have a dramatic impact. It is everywhere we're teaching it. It's an insight that we've not given previous until right now. What's going to happen to the United States of America as we're moving through these end times? What really is our destiny? I think you're going to be blessed. I think you're going, going to enjoy this particular lesson. So that will be at Metairie on Friday evening at Madison, Mississippi on Saturday evening. And then again on Sunday, on Sunday, breaking prophetic fulfillments. One of the breaking things right now. And we're also going to have a question and answer session at that time that everybody is tremendously enjoying. So uh, that's what we'll be doing this weekend. I hope you'll get to join us. Let's go now to the phones. Renee is calling from Georgia. Hello, Renee. Praise the Lord, Brother Baxter. How are you, Renee? Oh, we're doing really good. I sure wish we could make it uh, on that Israel trip with, with y'all this time around, maybe next time. Okay. Um, but I wanted to make a comment about something uh, Chris and I were talking about on, on the presidential um, election, uh, the, the potential beginning of World War III. Um, I heard it said that if we are in war, then we won't have, I don't know about all this, then we won't have uh, an election and President Obama can stay president. Then, of course, there's that idea about the, the uh, premature uh, thing about the uh, people who believe in Muhammad and they want their, I guess, called Mahdi or something or another to to come in, and, and then I'm going to hang up now and let you uh, respond to all that. Okay, Renee, thank you a lot for calling. Uh, well, uh, there's no proof whatsoever that if we are in war, there still wouldn't be elections. Uh, we have been in war twice before, and they have never suspended elections. Uh, I think it would be a tremendous suspension of our Constitution to do such a thing. I am not saying it's impossible, but I really do not believe it will happen. I believe the American people would rise up against that in mass because we cherish the fact that presidents are limited to two terms and that we have this shift in leadership so that we have a chance if a person doesn't uh, do what we think he should do, we have the ability to vote them out and furthermore, if any leader becomes too much in power for too long, it could move toward dictatorship. And that's the reason we installed term limits after Franklin D. Roosevelt, because a lot of people were concerned that he stayed in power for too long and it threatened the democratic process of the United States of America. So I really do not think that we are going to uh, see a suspension of our election process uh, is it absolutely impossible? No, nothing like that's impossible. But I really do not believe that the American people would stand still for that happening. Uh, so we're going to see what's going to happen. Now, that, another question, and by the way, we do have some open lines right now. If you'd like to get in, the number to call 
877 end time and uh, our operators are standing by to take your calls if you need to reach them but here to be on the air with me 877 end time but when we're looking at this whole picture uh, if this war truly is imminent and we know that President Obama has about 20 minutes 20 months left in his uh, term uh, will it happen under President Obama's watch or will it happen if a new president comes in? I can't tell you the answer to that. I can just tell you it's going to happen. I can't tell you for certain the U.S. is going to be involved. I really think the U.S. will be involved because we're involved right now. Nevertheless, I don't know how it's all going to come down but it is going to come down. That's the critical thing. When we look at snapshots that prophecy gives us of the end time, it allows us to see the way things are going to look. I've had a lot of people ask me, well, look, it looks like to me that Islam is going to rule the world. Will Islam rule the world? And I've been able to tell them, absolutely not. I know from the Bible what the end time government of the Antichrist and the false prophet will look like. And I know the nations that are going to participate in this end time one world government. Now, let's face it. If you look at the present situation with the growth and the assertiveness of Islam right now, it would make you think, wow, it looks like Islam is going to take over and rule the world. But then when you look at the Bible, Revelation chapter 13, it names the countries that will be the power base of the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, you've got a beast with the body of the leopard, Germany, the feet of the bear, Russia, the mouth of the lion, Great Britain, and the ten horns of the ten horn kingdom out of Europe. That is going to be the empire of the Antichrist. We have a very clear snapshot of it. And then something is added to that in Revelation 17. A woman rides on the back of this world government beast. And a woman in Bible prophecy always symbolizes a church. So there's going to be a religion that is in coalition with the end time beast of the Antichrist. And so that gives us a snapshot. So what's going to happen to Islam then? I have concluded that Islam is going to be horribly decimated with this war that emanates from the Euphrates River that's going to kill one-third of mankind. I, just by knowing what, where we're headed, I have reached that conclusion. So thank God for the prophecies of the Bible that do help us. Let's get back to the phones now. Uh, Jim is calling from Indiana. Hello, Jim. Yeah, uh, I've been reading and thinking about this and stuff, and... Uh, I've seen on CNN some computer experts in front of Congress that they, they said they could fix, rig the computer voting machines up so they would give three votes for the favored candidate for every one vote the unfavored candidate got. And Congress asked him if that could be detected, and he said no, he could set it up where it could not be detected. And I was wondering if, uh, especially because of Obama's second election, and it seems like they wanted somebody with Muslim roots in there because they knew that trouble was coming from the Muslims. I was wondering if you think the elections even matter, that if your vote even counts the way they got the computers. Uh, you know, Jim, I would really hate to think that our votes don't matter. Can I prove absolutely that all the votes and the calculations are accurate? I can't. All I know is this. This may be the last election for us to save America. And every person that holds Christian values, you should make sure that you vote in this coming election. And then we'll have to leave it up to God as far as any illegal manipulation that may or may not take place. I would certainly I'm hope that since both Republican and Democrats are there watching over the actions of the other person, I would hope that there are safeguards to make sure that everything is done fairly. That's something that I'm, you and I may not be able to control. Nevertheless, all I'm saying is, uh, since we don't have the ability to know for certain, then I say, let's have the greatest turnout of Christian people ever 
in the history of, the, of this nation. I'm asking no, not one Christian person stay home because this may be the, the, our last chance to see our I'm nation seeing, turn, turn around. So, on, CNN, on CNN, they said that uh, they asked for a paper trail and the, and the Congress, people from Congress said, what, you don't trust us? You want a paper trail? And there is no paper trail. It's all done on the computer on the boats, and that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I understand fully, Jim. And I, I've thought those thoughts with you. I've got to let you go. Let's go now to Rachel calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Rachel. Rachel, you're on the air. Hello, how are you doing? I'm wonderful. Thank you for calling. Good. My, my question is, um, this decimation possibly of the third of the world, couldn't it start beginning now with the, um, this Russia you know, uh, invading the Middle East? Uh, it certainly could be starting now. Like I said earlier in the program, some people think it started as early as 911. And of course, since 911, uh, you know, there have been a lot of people killed already, over 100,000 in Iraq and now then 250,000 in Syria. So it may already have begun. But of course, if it has, we're at the little end of it because. Uh, the amount, even if, if there's been 500,000 killed so far, that's nothing compared to 2.3 billion, which is a huge amount yet to come. So uh, I do believe we could already be in it, but it has not hit in all of its fury yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, do you think that Russia is going to stay in there to complete the biblical? Russia is going to maintain its presence in the Middle East. Right. However, the Bible doesn't say whether Russia participates in the Sixth Trumpet War or not. The Bible does say that Russia and Iran will invade Israel at the time of Armageddon. So as we see Russia establishing military bases, one in Syria, one in Iraq, it should certainly alarm us. And now that Iran has troops in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Iran, in Yemen, all the way around Israel. We are seeing the stage set for the Battle of Armageddon. But World War III and Armageddon are two different wars. And so right. we're talking about two different things there. Uh, okay. Rachel, well, thanks Lord a lot. Willing, I'll see you at the end of the month in San Antonio. Okay, very good. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, listen, our time has come and gone. One more time, let me tell you, I will be in Metairie, Louisiana on Friday evening in Madison, Mississippi, Saturday evening and Sunday morning. Hope to see you there. And we have one week left on our tour. If you're wanting to go, don't wait another day. Pick up the phone, call us 800 in time, ask to speak to someone about the tour. They'll answer all of your questions. It's going to be a great tour. I just have a feeling something wonderful is going to happen on this tour. I hope you get to go along. So until next time, God bless you. I'll see you back at this microphone this same time tomorrow. Politics and Religion is a production of End Time Ministries. It is a daily one-hour broadcast dedicated to bringing you the prophetic fulfillments happening on a daily basis. If you would like to listen to archive shows, subscribe to End Time Magazine, find a prophecy conference in your area, order End Time resources, watch our TV show, or subscribe to our free weekly e-news, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and take advantage of what our site has to offer. Connect to End Time Ministries by partnering with us and help this message make a global impact. End Time Ministries is partner supported. We would like to say thank you to all of our loyal partners, listeners, and friends for helping make politics and religion and End Time Ministries possible.